we thank you for the privilege that we have to come before you. Uh, and although we can't come together in person today, we thank you that we can each one come into your presence and share together in our faith with you. Bless our time as we spend it in, with you and in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A scripture this morning comes from Numbers chapter 35, verse 9 through 14. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. And the cities which you give, you shall have six cities of refuge. You shall appoint three cities on this side of Jordan, and three cities you shall appoint in the land of Canaan, which will be cities of refuge. The city of refuge is not something that we still use in our society today, and we may sometimes kind of lose sense of how important that could be in their day. My wife and I were uh, volunteer missionaries in Borneo shortly after we finished college, and uh, uh, it kind of surprised me a little bit to think back how long ago it was that we were there. It was actually 40 years ago plus. Uh, and uh, when we were there in Borneo, a number of things were different from what we had experienced or even what we expected. One of the things that was very different from what we expected was uh, we really didn't expect to see any evidence of the change of seasons like the leaves turning yellow in the fall around here in the United States. We were shocked when all of the trees on some of the hillsides started turning yellow. Uh, and eventually fell off the trees. It looked like New England in the fall on some of the hills there in a tropical Borneo. It turns out it was the rubber trees, and it was the dry season, and they go through a cycle of dropping their leaves and growing new leaves just as we do here, but for different reasons, not because of the cold, but because of the rainfall cycle there. I, I was quite unprepared to see yellow hillsides uh, in Borneo when we were there. There were other things that were different as well. We lived on the uh, uh, mission uh, school grounds that was about two, three hours drive out from the capital city of Kotakinabalu. And on the drive between where we were to the, to the main city, if you're going to the conference office or doing major shopping, you had to go down there. On the drive, there was a section that belonged to a different tribe from the people we lived with. We lived with the Kadazan tribe. Many of them were Christians. Uh, this other tribe was the Bajau tribe. And in Bajau country, things were different than the rest of Borneo. In Bajau country, you learned to do different things when you drove. Now, this was a third world country. The roads weren't very good. Um, parts of them, the pavement was bad or not, non-existent. I think mostly it was paved, but there was lots of potholes. And one thing you did not do was splash a pedestrian when you drove through a puddle on the road. That was just not okay. Now, they're walking along right on the edge of the road. It's not like you can't make them be there. You can't make them go away. You just better not splash them. Because if you do, uh, the story was, and I think it's probably true, if you ever stop in a marketplace in one of their villages and they recognize you as the one that splashed them, you will probably get beat up by a crowd for splashing the pedestrian. At night, you dimmed your headlights for pedestrians when you drove by. Um, cars and drivers were second-tier citizens on the roads in Bajau country. They did have fences, but the fences were not to keep the cattle off the roads. 
The fences were to keep the cattle out of the fields, which meant they kept them on the roads. <laughs> Don't hit a chicken. You just bought the chicken. If you hit a cow, you just bought the cow, and it probably would be cheaper not to buy that cow. But you're stuck buying that cow because you, you hit that cow. But here's where it really went contrary to all my basic training. If you hit a person. If you hit a person in Bajau country, do not stop. Do not try to help. It doesn't matter how badly or, 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 or how little they may or may not be injured, you go immediately, as fast as you safely can, to the next town that has a police station, and you get in the police station as quickly as you can. Kind of goes contrary to what we've been told about help the people, right? <laughs> Flee the scene and turn yourself in to the police. Why? To save one of the dramatic stories about why, I'm just going to say, do you want to live to see another sunrise? Then that's what you better do. You flee. If you don't, there's a good chance this was your last day on earth. It was in a culture like that that God says, I think you guys need cities of refuge. <laughs> what are we going to do for people who accidentally kill someone? Now, murder was a different thing, but these were for people who accidentally killed someone. And so they were scattered, spaced out across the land of Israel, these cities of refuge. Uh, and the reason they had them was because in that culture, there was the avenger. That's a near relative of whoever has been killed. And to, to, it was considered a matter of family honor to avenge the death of your relative who's been killed. And so they would kill whoever had killed their relative. Now, some of that still goes on in places like uh, New Guinea, where someone in this village is killed by someone in that village. So we'll go back and we'll kill four or five of yours, and you'll come back and kill five or ten of ours. And, and, and it escalates in the revenge cycle over there. Uh, in Israel... It was just the avenger and just the one who committed whatever had happened, who, the one who accidentally killed, who were directly involved. And, and it didn't escalate, but still God says, no, we need to have a way so that someone who, who kills accidentally is not then killed by the avenger. And so the, the person who accidentally kills someone else had to flee to the city of refuge. Uh, they maintained the roads to those cities. They maintained signage so you could see where it was. So you could easily get there. And if you accidentally killed someone in ancient Israel, you didn't stay to see what you could do to help. You fled immediately as fast as you could without stopping without resting, until you were safely inside the gates of the city of refuge. After that, then, uh, there would be a, a, an inquiry and a trial for you. Uh, in Numbers 35, verse 33, it says, So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land. And no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Now, this is primarily focusing on murder, but in a certain sense, it was also true for accidental death. And so what do you do for the person who is innocent of intent, but has nevertheless accidentally killed someone? They run to the city of refuge, and then there are rules by which they were to judge whether this was murder or an accident. Uh, some of those rules start in verse 16. If he strikes him with an iron implement so that he dies, he's a murderer. So did you use a weapon? The murderer shall surely be put to death. If he strikes him with a stone in the hand by which one could die and he dies, he's a murderer. 
the murderer shall surely be put to death. If he strikes him with a wooden hand weapon, he's a murderer. He shall surely be put to death. The avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. So God didn't completely take away the avenger rule. But what he says is that needs to operate within limits. It's interesting that uh, God put limits. In some places, uh, we wonder, what was God saying? Like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What God was doing was putting limits. In Bajau country, I assure you, it's not an eye for an eye. Uh, if, if, if you injured someone, we don't necessarily stop with you being equivalently injured. Uh, often it was your life that paid. Uh, and God's just saying, no, no, uh, not, no escalation. No escalation, that's not okay. Uh, and so in the cities of refuge, the person who fled there would then uh, sit before the elders who would judge the case. What happened? Um, and then uh, verse 20, if he pushes him out of hatred or while lying in wait hurls something at him so he dies or in enmity strikes him with his hand so he dies, the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He's a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. Uh, essentially, the city of refuge, if a person is determined to actually be a murderer and it was not an accidental killing, the murderer would be turned over to the avenger uh, and uh, the avenger would kill the murderer. But if he does it without enmity, verse 22, uh, without lying in wait, uh, he throws something, but he didn't know he was there, uh, didn't see him, wasn't his enemy or seeking his harm. And one of the things that that says, which is kind of a practical thing, uh, it, it, the scripture also says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Well, if you accidentally killed the person that you have been having an ongoing quarrel with, the, the, the biblical rules suggest that the jury should uh, weigh toward in you were intending it if you had previous bad dealings with the victim. <laughs> so you don't want to keep a, a, a live quarrel going with anybody just on the basis of if you accidentally hurt that person, it's going to look like you did it intentionally uh, and uh, you really don't want that. Make up right away with anybody you've got a quarrel with, lest you find yourself looking like it was intentional when it really wasn't. Now, verse 26. If the manslayer at any time goes outside the limits of the city of refuge where he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the limits of his city of refuge, the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. That is, once you come to the city of refuge and you are determined to have killed someone inadvertently, accidentally, you stay at the city of refuge. You can't leave. Now, there, I think our, our garden zones around each of these Levitical cities, you could probably go out there, but you can't go past that. If you go past the limits of that city's immediate turf and the avenger finds you and he'll check on you, if he hears you're out wandering around, he'll look for a chance to get you. Uh, if he finds you out beyond the limits, when he kills you, he's not guilty of murder. You were supposed to stay in that city. That's where your protection is. That's where your safety is. Uh, you need to be there. Uh, you can't leave and go home. Verse 28 says, the, verse 27 said that the avenger is not guilty if he catches you out. Because he, that is the person who has come for refuge, he should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. You stay there in the city of refuge till the high priest dies. Now that's an office for life. So this could be a while. It's not necessarily short term. It's not till the next election cycle. No, it's, it's a until the natural death of the high priest. But there is that you can go home after the death of the high priest. 
So what does this say to us uh, of use in, in our era of this world's history? Well, I think one of the things it says is we need to be careful because life is very precious and totally irreplaceable. We can't put it back. God can, but we cannot. And even accidental death is serious. So the, the person who accidentally kills someone is not guilty of murder. But in our society, I think often we, we say, well, well it, it wasn't intentional, and so therefore it, it doesn't mean anything. Well, no, it does mean something. And the Bible is quite clear. It is serious. Even if it's an accident, it's serious, and we need to be careful that we don't do anything that is going to harm others. It's not like nothing happened, even though you're not guilty, uh, and you are not going to be punished as a murderer, it still is serious. A life has been lost, and it doesn't, it doesn't meet its full resolution until the death of the high priest. And my understanding of that is that the death of the high priest is going to be the substitute for the death of the one who accidentally killed someone. So we don't take that life, but the death of the high priest will cover for that. Uh, interestingly, the, the New Testament picks up on the idea of running for refuge, and we find it in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hope of the to lay hold of the hope set before us. What have we done? We have fled for refuge. Where do we flee for refuge? We flee to Jesus for refuge. And the, uh, the Bible points out that we have an adversary seeking to destroy us. That's the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, He is like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. If the devil catches us out away from Jesus, unprotected, uh, he can have access to us and, and do damage to us, uh, and we need to, to flee for refuge to Jesus. Now, the death of the high priest in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but it was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a high priest. Who is our high priest? That's Jesus. Jesus is our high priest, so his death substitutes for us and frees us from guilt and condemnation and death, which belong to us but we are shielded from it because we have come to Jesus for refuge. Some years ago, uh, we had an evangelistic meeting in Minnesota, uh, and one young fellow came to just a, a couple of the meetings, and when we were planning to have a, a Daniel seminar as a follow-up, uh, I went to visit his uh, apartment, uh, and, and as I knocked on the door, I thought to myself, he's come to only a couple of the meetings, only at the end of the series, and the chance that he will ever come to this Daniel series is really, really low. But I'm going to knock on the door anyway. You, you never know, you know, there's, there's this long shot chance. And uh, turns out Matt was very interested in Daniel and prophecy, and he came to most of that series uh, quite faithfully attended that series. Uh, and, and eventually, uh, after I left the district, he became a member 
in one of the other churches in the other end of the district uh, and was a faithful member there, the last I knew, still serving the church there uh, as one of the younger people in the church, keeping it going while the old people got old. Uh, he, he was a real blessing to that church. But after knowing Matt for a while, I, I discovered that he had something that was just eating on him. It was a pain that wouldn't go away inside. He had gone to a convenience store at a gas station one day, bought something in the store, hopped in his car, and backed out. And what he didn't know was some other teenagers were there, and, and they were filming a home video in which one of their friends was pretending to have been run over by a car, and they were filming this. They picked randomly Matt's car to have their friend under the back wheels. And Matt never saw the person there, backed over them, and actually killed them. Actually killed them. Now, now clearly, he has no fault or blame, right? But somebody's dead that he ran over and he just couldn't get past that. He just couldn't get past that. It just kept eating on him. And I could see why. So I talked to Matt about the cities of refuge and what God said to do when someone accidentally kills someone else. You go to the city of refuge. You didn't murder. But it's not like it doesn't matter. And I think that was part of what bothered Matt. If you just say, I didn't mean it. Yeah, but they're still dead. They're still dead. What do you do with that? And the city of refuge explains that even when you're not guilty, the damage done still matters. It does, it does. What are we going to do with that? What we're going to do with that is we're going to give that to the high priest. We're going to let him take that for us and let his death pay for that and, and cover for that so that you can be released. And that did the trick. Matt got past it after that. Before that, I never thought I would find a practical use for the cities of refuge other than some interesting study into the ways that God had set up the justice system in ancient Israel, which does give us some insight into God's character and his goodness and his graciousness. Yes, that it does. But I never thought I'd find a 20th century application of the cities of refuge. I really didn't expect that till I met Matt Gaden. And then found out it really does still help. It really does still help to know what God set up to deal with a situation like that. Accidental death is not just okay. We don't just say, it doesn't matter, you didn't mean it. That's not going to help Matt Gaten. Everybody knew he didn't mean to. Uh, everybody knew it wasn't intentional on his part. But it didn't set him free from the guilt until he realized that God had set up a way for even those who accidentally kill someone to hand that off to the high priest whose, de whose death will pay the debt for all of us. We run to Jesus for refuge for many things, not just accidental death, although that was one that was certainly the, the, the focus of the cities of refuge in ancient Israel. Jesus is our refuge from all our risk of death. That's where we flee. Don't stop, don't wait, don't argue with the devil. 
run to Jesus and get into the city of refuge. And from there, we'll, we'll take it from there. And I think it's an important lesson for us to see that, yes, life is important. It's irreplaceable. And even accidental death is not just okay. It's serious. And it needs to be treated as serious. And therefore, the cities of refuge, and therefore, we run to Jesus in circumstances like that. Um, I wanted to read a couple of verses of a hymn to you that came to my mind while I was uh, working on this sermon. Number 525 in, in the church hymnal, Hiding in Thee. I want to read the first and the last verses. O oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. So sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. We flee for refuge to the rock of ages, that's Jesus. Hiding in thee, hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. Verse 3. How oft in the conflict when pressed by the foe, I have fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often when trials like sea billows roll, have I hidden in thee, O thou rock of my soul. Hiding in thee, hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. Jesus is our rock of ages. He is our city of refuge. He is the one we flee to for refuge from the destroyer who wants to destroy us. Whatever the issue is, we can fly there for refuge. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you care about us, that you want to see us protected from death, Either by accident or by intent, we need to go to you for refuge. And whether we ourselves have accidentally caused damage to others, teach us to come to you uh, for forgiveness, for cleansing, for protection, for the release of guilt that we can find in you. I, th I thank you for the, the illustrations that I experienced over in Borneo, quite against my grain, which says stop and help. There were times that we need to not stop and help, but run to refuge. Or for the relief of the, the pain and the guilt that Matt Gaden felt. Lord, thanks for giving that to us. Thank you for being our all-sufficient Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.